Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Morena, everyone. I hope you're having a fabulous week. And for those of us in New Zealand, undoubtedly looking forward to the long weekend ahead. Now, a few weeks ago, I published my interview with Zach Bitter, and today I'm super stoked to bring you guys the conversation I had with Zach's wife, Nicole Bitter. Now, Nicole is a lifelong endurance athlete. She's a former D1 athlete, an ultra marathon athlete, and she's an attorney who logs 60 plus hours a week for Willis Towers Watson. Nicole is a fabulous runner in her own own right so she's up there just like Zach is with regards to her accomplishments in the ultra running and trail running scene. This conversation that Nicole and I have comes at the back of her most recent race where she took out the Havelina 100 in the second fastest time in that event which is an amazing achievement. Nicole and I talk about the Havelina 100 and how she found that race, what her training was like leading up into the event, but also talk about her history in the sport, how she got into running, you know, some of the biggest challenges she's experienced, but also some of her biggest achievements as well. And we talk about how she manages to fit her training in and around her hefty work schedule. So, you know, she brings these performances of a professional athlete, yet she juggles that with not only a full-time career or more than that, but also in a household where clearly running takes priority for the other member as well, Zach. So, you know, it's such an awesome conversation in and around how they manage their ultra running household. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation that I have with Nicole Bitter. Nicole, how are you? Thanks for joining me today. Great. No, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor. Now, have you run this morning? Where are you at with your recovery from the Havelina 100? So at this point, I'm I'm fairly recovered. So I am just um, back in training. So I'm just trying to get some speed back and um, just get some turnover in the legs. So I ran about 12 miles this morning. Fantastic. And um, what's the weather like, Nicole? Um, you know, it's actually fairly chilly in the morning. So it was about 40 degrees this a.m. Um, so yeah, it will heat up to about the high 60s here. Um, and that's obviously in Fahrenheit. So I don't know. It, you have much more pleasant weather, I think, over there at this point. At this point, although um, that nice chilly morning run feel is is quite lovely, really. So, Nicole, now, can you kick us off? Because I'm really interested to hear your running background, how you kind of got into your longer events. And as I understand it, you began running kind of in your early teen years when you didn't make the basketball team. Uh, yes, yes. So I started running in middle school. Um, I just wanted to do a school sport and um, I did try out for the basketball team, was not going to make it, couldn't even shoot a layup, I don't think. And the gym teacher pulled me aside and said, I think you should join the cross country team. You're fairly fast in the mile. So after that, I was hooked um, and I started running in middle school and through high school and college. Um, and I guess I've been running ever since. When did your focus change from the kind of cross country, the, so I guess the shorter stuff, to your longer events? Because it's when I look at your kind of race stats, you seem to have amazing success in the longer distance, but across like a wide spectrum of them, like the 50 right up to the 100 miles. So when did your attention kind of switch to those longer races? Actually, I I started running with a group um, in Dallas. I had gone through law school and I had 
running had kind of taken a backseat at that point. I had just been more recreationally running and training. Um, when I graduated and started working, um, I adopted a foster dog and she was just so high energy and needed to go out almost twice a day for runs. And she would just pull me along. So she really got me back into shape. Um, and at that same time, I, I lucked out and met a group of training partners that uh, was meeting close to my home. And they were primarily training for marathons, but there were some runners in the group that were focused on ultras. And so uh, that really got me started. And I just started jumping into some races. I figured that I liked the long run, so I might as well try it out and see what it was like. Um, so I really just got into it for fun as something to do, uh, see new um, terrain. And um, I was hooked after that. Yeah, and what was your first kind of real success? Can you remember kind of like doing an event and going, actually, you know, I'm pr this is like something I, you know, can excel at or, you know, something that really drives you to want to do really well at? Yeah, um, so I think I started, my first races were night races in Texas. And, um, you know, I just enjoyed being out there. It was just a challenge. And I think um, from the get-go, I started to have success at, I think it was a 60K distance. Um, and I just found that I was doing well and performing well in those braces. And that just got me hooked. And then I just started going up in distance and, uh so then I tried a 50 miler and then I was on to 100K and 100 miles. So I haven't really wanted to venture much past that. I think about 100 miles is about where I feel comfortable. Um, but um, yeah, I, I've just kind of just kept trying to push my limits through trying different distances. And I, I like doing different events just so that there's always the continuous challenge. So it's nice to just do different things so that you don't get bored of just always running a 50 mile or always running a hundred miles. So that's why I, I just like to keep it um, exciting. Yeah, that's, I completely appreciate that. I am um, with my running, I, I enjoy doing different events, but in part for me, I'm like, well, I've not done this event, so I can't possibly compare my other time to what I'm going to do now so because I'm I'm always running on that fear of failure and fear of not doing as as I as I think I should be able to run but also as I perceive others think I should run you know so when you do a new event or a new distance this is this is my thing um at least I don't have that although unlike you Nicole I'm I think I want to do a longer event my longest has been has been 60k so I enter them and then about four weeks or six weeks out I'm like what am I thinking I'm going to be miserable for that last quarter of that race now I'll just like drop down to the to the 50k which kind of seems to be at this point in time my kind of like settle place if you like or my happy place yeah yeah well you've got to do what you love you know what what interests you so that's always the challenge it's kind of like I think we all have this perception that we have to run further in order for it to, for, in order to keep pushing ourselves. Yeah. And a lot of times that's not true. It's just um, whatever I think you find as your personal challenge, that's what you should concentrate on. So I don't really have this desire to push, push much past a hundred miles. So I think you just have to figure out what, I think you can find challenges in so many different ways because you can try and run faster at the event. Um, you can try and minimize your stops. There's so many ways that you can keep just improving and finding value in what you're doing. So maybe that is about the distance that you're meant to do. Do you know, I agree with you and I, I wonder as well, like, because you've, you're just getting into some training, you're doing some faster training at the moment and I know the, the feeling of kind of freshness and almost it's kind of exciting to jump into something different. If you've been doing a lot of longer stuff, it kind of gives you a little bit of, um, it, it is a challenge, but it's also, oh, something 
different to do for a while as you get back into it. Are you experiencing that right now with what you're doing? Yeah, no, I think so. I think it just keeps it invigorating for sure. Just having that challenge. Yeah. No, I think you're spot on. Nicole, I heard you speak on your husband's sex podcast, Human Performance Outliers, and oh. you did such a, a wonderful job of giving us details on Havelina 100, which is your most recent success, uh, which was amazing. And I definitely want to talk to you a little bit about that. One thing you did say is that you felt that COVID had 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 an impact on your relationship to running and first I'll say I really liked how you put that because I feel like that's how a runner feels with running like it's more than just the sport that they do it really is it's so much more complex than that like it's it yeah. means so much more to us runners so how were you feeling I suppose prior to COVID because obviously you would have just come off the Tarawera race here in New Zealand and and what changed for you? I think it was just an opportunity to take a step back and there weren't races for a long period of time, which was nice. So you could just really concentrate on training. And then I think even more than that, it was just nice because I think my life was a bit more simplified. So I didn't have to travel as much for work, um, which was an added perk. I just had the opportunity to really focus on training and sleeping well. So I think in that sense, I really just found um, that running was giving me a lot of enjoyment too. I just had more time to concentrate on it. So I think it was just a really a win overall. Yeah. So in the lead up to that, were you losing that enjoyment? Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think over the last couple of years, I had just probably taken on too much. Yeah. So just trying to balance all of the running, racing, traveling, working, all of it. it. It just maybe I was a little overwhelmed and I didn't really realize it because when you get the opportunity to run a great race and see a new place, you want to jump in, or at least I do. So I think, um, you know, I've just maybe been burning the candle a bit thin. Um, so it was just nice to kind of reprioritize and have a chance to really kind of focus on a couple things and just doing them well. Yeah. Um, because I think it's challenging just to juggle. I think we all face this in life. There's just so many different competing priorities. Mm. Um, so when you really have the chance to ensure that you're concentrating on just a couple of things, I find that I am able to do better. So I think running just was given more attention and time. Yeah, because you have such a full life. So you've you've got your running, you've got your career as a lawyer, you're a foster mom to, you know, a few um, four-legged, how many, is it just one that you, one dog that you have at the, at the moment? Um, yeah, so we, um, during the pandemic, that was one of the great opportunities that we had to foster dogs. So we've had a couple um, of little high energy guys that have been with us. So our first foster, we had about three months, and then we've had our current foster for about five months. Wow. He's been with us for a while. Yeah, yeah. So he's made a lot of, um, we've seen a lot of growth from him, but he was just a really high energy dog. And so um, they were having trouble placing him with the rescue group. But we find that if he gets his run every morning, he's he does really well. So right now on the podcast, he he's just sleeping under my feet. Oh, <laughs> cute. So, yeah. But it, it, you're right. It is a lot. Nicole, how do you actually, how do you juggle your work with your training? Because you're not just training for 5k or a half marathon. Like you, it, you know, a, a, you can't kind of fake a 50 miler or a 100 miler. So how do you fit it in? No, well, I know so many of us. I mean, there are so many people that are even so much busier than me. Um, I just find that I really like to get out and do my primary workout in the morning. Mm -hmm. So whether it be, you know, 5 a.m., if that's when I have time to get the run in, that's when I want to, you know, get out because I think, if I wait till later in the day, something else is going to pop up and it's just going to um, interfere with training. So I usually always try and run early on. 
And I break up a lot of my workouts. So a lot of times I do my primary run in the morning. And then it's really, I find a nice break in the afternoon if I have a little window, which I usually do. I can usually um, get out the door. And one of the nice things about the pandemic is um, everything's remote. So um, I mostly am always just working in running clothes. So maybe have a, you know, a nice top on and then, but really I'm wearing running clothes. So then when I get a break in the day, I'm out the door and get that second run in. So I just kind of squeeze it in when I can, but it's just nice. I I think I'm much more productive when I'm able to run. Mm. I just think, you know, we all spend so many hours in front of a computer. And sometimes I think you just kind of, if, if you know you have something you have to get done, you just, really are more efficient. And so I think I've just been able to find more efficiencies in what I do, which allows me to get out the door and run. So, yeah. 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 And what does a typical kind of base week look like for you, Nicole, in terms of your training? Um, so I probably run about a hundred miles a week as standard. Mm. Um, and so I try and usually do about two workouts and one long run. And that, you know, it can change depending on where we are in the year. Um, But that's what I usually find is most successful for me. And I've been doing that for quite a long period of time. That's just where I kind of naturally gravitate to. Mm. Um, And and what about if you're kind of in your lead up to your longer events, like what, 100 miles or maybe 100K even, how much do you mm -hmm. stick at that kind of 160 miles and it just change the distribution of those miles or do you? Um, yeah, that's probably pretty common. So I may just do two longer runs on the weekend, just kind of do back to back if I'm mm. really trying to mirror what I want to do for a 100 mile race. Um, I also may just cut out workouts. So I might just do one workout and it's kind of shorter um, during the week. If I'm building up for a 100 mile race, I would say that's pretty standard. Yeah. And it's just really concentrated on getting the miles in. So I think in my build up for Javelin, I was probably closer to 120 for a couple weeks. Mm. Um, but it, it just kind of varies depending on the event. Um, I try and make sure to get climbing in too if the route is going to be focused on climbing, which Javelina wasn't. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of those different variables can influence kind of what I'm going to concentrate my training on. Yeah. Um, we're lucky. We have um, we have access to pretty mountainous terrain here. We also have pretty flat canal paths to train on. So um, that's really beneficial about the Phoenix area. Absolutely. So pretty much regardless of the race, you're probably going to find something that might be suited to the terrain that you're going to be racing on. Right, right. So that's that's beneficial. And Nicole, are you a proponent of strength training in your um, with your running or any other cross training that you do to help with injury prevention or or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely like to do some strength training. Um, just make sure to incorporate that in a couple of times a week. Um, I also try and do cross training. So um, I'm happy to go on a bike ride or I really like rollerblading. So yeah. I'll get out there once in a while and do things like that. But yeah, cross training is excellent. So any way to kind of diversify training, especially when I'm feeling fatigued. Mm, mm -hmm. And do you have periods of your of your kind of training cycle where you already know that you're going to have a dip in your energy and or um, yeah, something like that that might make you kind of forecast, okay, this is going to be a download week. So how do you how do you do those kind of have those kind of um, download weeks in your training? So I typically go mostly by feel. Mm. Um, if I'm not if I'm feeling tired or fatigued, I just usually take some time. Mm. Um, and I'm really trying to be good about that, especially as I get older. I think it's really important. Um, I'm getting close to 40, so I'm really starting to monitor things like that. I haven't really noticed that I've felt kind of a decrease in what I can handle, but I'm sure I'm not far away yeah. um, given my age. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think I typically do about three 
harder weeks and one easier week as kind of a deload week. So that helps me with my training a lot. So if we're gearing up for a big race, that's, I think, typically the approach. But it really just depends on how I feel. Um, I was supposed to do a workout on Saturday and Zach was going to ride his bike along with me. Um, and I just felt really tired and I had mm. had like a really hard couple of weeks at work. So we just decided, eh, we're just going to back off and wait till Monday to do the workout. And I did. And then today I did my workout and I had a great day. So I think it's really, you know, I think the longer you do this, the more you realize you're able to listen to your body and the more you trust it. Mm. And when you shouldn't, you know, when you shouldn't push and when you should. And yeah. so I've really tried to... Um, make sure I, I listen to my body. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I talk to like a number of uh, run coaches over here who are in that Lydia type training model, if you like. And actually, if I think about a lot of the run coaches who I follow or who I've had advice on, it always seems to be kind of variations on the Lydia um, kind of style training. And and they talk about, you know, as a, as a master's athlete, what tends to happen with the people they coach is that that, that seven day week actually extends to about a 10 day week. So yeah. this, they're kind of still getting in the workouts within a training cycle, but the the, the cycle itself has, has kind of extended. Yeah, no, I think you're spot on. And that's what Zach's always told me as well. So I think, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I'm sure that's something I'll get to know as I um, as I get older, so yeah. And does, so so is Zach your coach then, or or? Um, yeah, I think I think he's he's such a lucky guy now to be my coach. But um, <laughs> yeah, he he pretty much guides me in what I do. Historically, I didn't really work with anyone, mm. um, but at this point, he's I, he kind of guides me in my workouts. Yeah, but I figure he knows me best, so. Um, probably not worth hiring a coach if my husband can kind of watch and decide, you know, what I need. Um, and he does a really great job. So I've had a lot of success since he's been coaching me. <laughs> so interesting, funny, right? The, um, that whole relationship dynamic, dynamic. So we both run, neither of us are run coaches and we have varying levels of kind of, um, experience if you like. Um, uh, but that whole, kind of that dynamic between a couple but also someone guiding someone else and and with Barry and I we take turns at deciding who's going to you know know the most on any particular day <laughs> and just the potential yeah. fallout that that can have actually so it's great that it works in your household yeah yeah I mean I think that's true you know if we weren't having success with it I probably would need to look elsewhere um but, you know, I think a lot of it is I kind of know what to do at this point, but it's yeah. nice to have somebody to just kick ideas off of. And then he finesses like and takes more details. So he helps me a lot with my workouts mm. in terms of just my day to day running. I kind of know what to do there, but it's really nice to have him um, helping with the workouts. Mm. Um, the other beneficial part about Zach that I have to say that I'm very grateful for is a lot of times he paces me. So it's really yeah. nice to have him jump in to work out. Um, you know, he's taking some time off right now, which he definitely should. Um, but he rode his bike with me today. So it's really nice to have him and his support. I'm really grateful that um, he's willing to work with me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because Nicole, do you, um, the other interesting thing I felt with your running is that you don't wear a watch, do you? No, I haven't for a long time. I think in college, I just was sick of really being kind of a slave to pace and my watch. And in all honesty, I got really sick of having a watch tan. I don't know why, <laughs> but I was living in warm places and I was kind of like, I think this is obvious that I spend too much time with a watch on. Yeah. So for me, um, you know, I was able to say, I need a break from the watch and I think it was really beneficial. Now I do, I don't, I still don't actually technically own a watch, but given that Zach oftentimes paces me at workouts, I end up knowing my splits. So mm. like today we did about six miles hard and he was telling me what my splits were. So, yeah. you know, I do have that benefit of a watch at this point. Um, but, you know, I think for me, it was just a nice break to, 
um, really just concentrate on enjoying running versus concentrating on a pace. Um, I am pretty in tune with the pace I'm running. So it only really becomes super impactful when I'm going fast and a workout. Um, Otherwise, I have a good sense of kind of my pace, I would say. Yeah. And it sounds like you just have a good intuitive sense of just your body and your running in general, you know, like so and so probably in part that having the sense of pace probably comes with that. And I do wonder, you know, how many of us runners would probably be quite similar if we weren't kind of a slave to having the the watch if you like and I know so many people talk about going out running without a watch so they're not so data driven because you can override so much of that intuition if what you are you know if if you're constantly looking at your watch and constantly trying to follow the direction of that rather than actually just thinking about how you're feeling at the time yes I think that's spot on and I think it would be really advantageous I think a lot of people would find value with not wearing a watch Yeah. Now, Nicole, if I can um, ask you a little bit on the nutrition front. So from the podcast that you did with SAC, as I understand it, you follow a fairly a lower carb or a carb appropriate type diet with your running. How has that evolved over time? Has that changed? And and when did that change make? Or or, sorry, when was that change Um. made? You know, I've pretty much been eating pretty much the same type of diet since I was in college. It's Mm -hmm. a lot of based on experimentation. So I just kind of found what works for me. So I still definitely incorporate carbs. I think they're very important, but I probably just don't follow a traditional high carb diet like they would probably say for endurance athletes was the standard approach in the past. Um, And this definitely predates Zach. So this was kind of been my standard approach since again, I was in college. Um, But I just found that I do better when I really strategically incorporate carbs at certain times of the day. So, um, you know, that's, that's what's always worked well for me, Mm. but I really think it's figuring out what works best for the athlete. So, Mm. Um, I just found that I had less stomach issues by kind of following my approach. Um, I still eat lots of carbs. Um, I guess, you know, when you're running as much as we do, you need a stand, you need a sig- significant amount of calories every day. Mm. So I definitely love bread. So I eat lots of sourdough bread. It's a favorite. Mm. Um, so things like that, I definitely incorporate into my diet. So I just want to be careful not to say I don't eat carbs because that's just so far from the reality, right? Um, And I know Zach gets that a lot, but for me, carbs are definitely important. I just would say I'm not really a traditional um, high carb person. I also just really do eat a lot of meats and proteins. I find them very important. I especially think as I get older, I'm really trying to make sure I get enough protein in the day because the more I hear from Zach, it just becomes more and more important. Mm. But I'm not, um, I don't know, I don't really track calories or anything like that. So yeah, um, I've never done anything more precise in terms of macros. So. Yeah, yeah. So what, is a, what does a typical day's food look like for you? Um, you know, I really try and have a pretty substantial breakfast after I finish a workout. So maybe oatmeal with banana, something like that. I probably have kind of, um, and that's a pretty, that's a probably a pretty big meal for me. Um, I usually get really busy in the middle of the day. So I probably will have like something rushed. So I might've made like salmon from the night before, have that. Um, And then for dinner, I'll have, again, more of a substantial dinner. So some kind of protein, some kind of carb, like bread, vegetables, or a salad. So that's kind of probably a standard day um, for me. And then, you know, I like to have dessert, so something at night. But it's pretty varied depending on the day. And it also just depends on how much exercise I do in the day. Mm. So if I'm mostly just sitting in meetings and I'm not running a lot, obviously I probably, you know, may not eat as much. But if I'm really hungry and I had a big workout, I'll eat more. Yeah. What's a favorite meal? 
you know, I'm really, I'm such a big salmon person. I love yeah. salmon. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know, but for me, that's like one of my favorite foods. So that was some kind of vegetable and I love sourdough bread. Mm, mm. <laughs> Do you know, it's really interesting you describe your approach to nutrition and I find this a lot with like a number of clients, but also I have a lot of running friends and when I started working with endurance athletes, I found it really interesting that we were given, you know, these are the guidelines, the sports nutrition guidelines that you should be working with your um, athletes, but then not being able to actually, like when I'm talking to the individual and we were figuring out, you know, how their diet was going to kind of play out, it was, there was no way that we could get them to consume the amount of carbohydrates that they required while still getting in the protein and the fat which was so essential for recovery yeah. and and um, just overall health and and I remember thinking gosh does everyone have this problem you know in terms of nutrition colleagues and then across the board all of us were like you know these are the guidelines but none of us actually follow the guidelines when we're when we're working with our athletes and, and I think you raise a really good point that a quote-unquote low-carb approach isn't necessarily low carb it's just when you make particularly when you do have high caloric requirements you're probably getting in quite a lot but just in proportion to the other foods on balance it might appear that the percentage is a little bit um lower and also because of the number of calories you probably spend or oh, sorry the training you probably spend quite a bit of time in that glycogen depleted state so you're probably well able to burn fat as a fuel source and you're probably quite metabolically flexible. Yeah, and I would say uh, that is very spot on. Um, I do find that I'm pretty um, flexible in terms of what I can have. Mm. So I'm very blessed on a race. I can pretty much eat anything. I mean, I don't want to jinx myself, but I usually am pretty, um, I have a pretty robust ability to deal with whatever I'm going to eat on race day. So yeah, I I think all of this is interesting. I obviously hear Zach talk about it so much. Um, and I, I, yeah, it would just be interesting. You obviously have so much insight in into this area too. So I love to be a fly in the wall and hear um, what you all have to say on the topic. Well, I will say that your focus on protein is 100% spot on, given that as we age, our ability to digest and absorb or stimulate that muscle protein synthesis from leucine does diminish so you know you listen to your body and you figure out what is so much more satisfying are those like proteins and fats with regards to that and recovery is so much better when you have that kind of real food kind of focus I think yeah, no. Well, you make me feel better. So um, <laughs> then I, I should be doing, I'm doing everything okay, thankfully. It's always so hard to know because you hear so many different things. But, you know, I, I've just gravitated what works for me. And I've mm. just been doing this so long that I just try and stick with what works. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear what people say. And obviously you want to um, tune in to the latest of what science indicates, but a lot of it is, I think, self-experimentation because I think so many of our bodies are different um, yeah. and what we can tolerate. So I know at this point what I like and what seems to work for me and I go with that. Yeah. And Nicole, have you, uh, do you take any supplements? You know, I, I take iron supplements. Um, mm. I, I did find that I was low in iron for a bit of time and I have upped my meat intake as a result too, just my red meat, um, just because of that. But I do take iron supplements. Mm -hmm. I need to get my blood work done to see how I'm doing. I feel like um, hopefully the numbers have increased, but about three years ago, I noticed that I was having some issues. So mm. definitely iron. But other than that, I, I take a multivitamin, but um, nothing else really. So I should probably ask you what else I should be taking. <laughs> well, it's, it's um, interesting. So at least you have a love of salmon. So, because that's one thing which a lot of people fall short on are those omega-3 fatty acids. Um, yeah. So at least you don't have to worry so much about about that. And iron is it's that seems to be like a lot of runners need to take iron, but shy away yeah. because of the digestive issues that they have 
with a lot of the yeah. iron supplements, but there are loads of like gentle um, iron supplements um, out there. And all I would say is you probably already take your iron in the morning and probably take it outside of coffee and likely take yes. it within 60 minutes of finishing your training. So you, I, yes. like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that you're probably doing um, everything right about that. But it, I'm, I imagine it's quite difficult right now to get bloods and stuff done just with regards to priorities of the health system and, and all the rest of it. Yeah, 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 that's one of the reasons why I haven't had any blood work done. But I would like to, um, you know, when we make some progress here, although in the United States we just don't seem to be able to figure things out. So things just do are not getting better here. They seem to be getting pretty bad. So um, I think it may be a while, but you know, in the meantime, I seem to be feeling really strong. So, you know, I feel like when I was having iron issues a couple of years ago, I could, I definitely were, was feeling fatigued. And so um, I think that's a good indicator oftentimes mm -hmm. that you're low iron, but since I've, since then I've um, improved. So I think that's, that's definitely beneficial. Yeah, for sure. And it's really interesting. It's, and it can be quite good to get your blood's done when you are um, feeling good. So you kind of have that baseline of, okay, I feel good. What does my blood work look like? And then use that as a, you know, when you're not feeling so good, you can kind of compare the two as well. So fingers crossed that, I mean, I can't imagine there's going to be this amazing improvement in the next few months, but you know, in terms of the situation in the States, but yeah, yeah, you, you're doing what you need to, Nicole. You're kind of like just going with how you feel. And I think that's all you can really do. Well, I feel like my work life is pretty structured. So I try and keep running fairly unstructured. And so mm. I just try and go a lot by feel. Um, and I think it has advantages and disadvantages, but that's kind of my approach. So I don't spend probably as much time going through data and looking at numbers because so much of my day job is doing mm. something like that. So I try and just really make running as fun as it can be. Yeah, yeah. And I just like and the success that you've had by treating your running like that, like tells me that like I wonder how much more benefit you would gain from then really kind of dialing into that data, you know, for for the kind of subsequent, you know, burden it would add to how you would have to approach it. Yeah, I don't think it would be beneficial to me. I think it would just feel like another life stressor and I don't mm. I just don't imagine I'd find success with that approach. So I've just kind of figured eh, I'll just go with um, with the approach I've been using and it seems to be working. Yeah. Nicole, can we kind of switch over and, and have a chat about the Havelina 100, which I did for um, quite a while ago. Oh, Nicole's doing the Javelina Jundred? And Barry, my <laughs> husband's like, mate, no, heavily 100. I'm like, oh, right. Um, so you went into that race. Um, and am I, is it, was it about six weeks ago as we're talking or eight weeks ago now? Yeah. You know, it was the 31st of October, which is Halloween. Um, yeah. here. So yeah, yeah. do you all celebrate Halloween? I didn't know. We, a little bit, like much more Not than we used like, to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, probably seven weeks ago, yeah. So um, maybe, yeah, six and a half. Um, so how did you feel going into the race? Like, did you feel like a lot of your training had gone according to plan and you were feeling really confident? Do, do other um, competitors in the race, do you have a, do you think about them or do you really only focus on you and your performance? You know, a lot of times I do think about other competitors when I go into a race, just I want to get a sense of, you know, maybe where I should be in the field. But a lot of times I really don't spend much of the race focused on them. I really just kind of try and run my own race. And I really focused on that in this 100 mile race. Yeah. Um, I knew there were going to be tough competitors. So Camille was running the 100 and she's amazing. Um, so I figured, you know, she would start out um, at a quick pace. And I just really concentrated on running, um, a time that would be successful for me. Um, 
And I had been out on the course with Zach and we had done some training runs. So I had a really good sense of what I should be aiming for. Mm. Um, And I just really tried to laser in on that. And that was my focus of the day, really just running my own race. Mm. And I typically find that that's where I have the most success. Yeah. So what did you have pre-race, Nicole? Did you did you have any breakfast or you do you like to go in feeling a little lighter and with not much on board? Um, I had a bagel and I had a little bit of peanut butter on it. Um, mm. And I don't think I, I probably had like three fourths. It felt like it was going to be a little heavy that day. I was, you know, some days I'm more hungry in the morning than others, but I wasn't quite as hungry on the morning mm-hmm. of Havelina, so I didn't finish it. But I felt like that was a pretty substantial breakfast. And um, the good thing was that I didn't have to start eating quite as early for me. Um, I just felt like I was a bit full. Mm. So that held me over for a bit of time. But I usually just go by how I feel. So in the mornings, if I'm feeling hungry, I'll eat more or less depending on that sensation. Mm. Um, But I do remember the morning of Havelina, I was kind of, I was pretty hungry. Yeah. And (laughs) do you get nervous leading, like leading up to your races? Yeah, for sure. I I always definitely get nervous. You know, there's always that fear. What about if I have an issue? What about if I didn't, um, I do something wrong? I don't know. I always get nervous, but I think I just try and channel it into the best that I can into just focusing on what I need to do. Um, Mm. But yes, I definitely get nervous. Yeah, and I imagine that, or and for me, I the longer the event, the more nervous I get because it feels like there's so much more that I can't control or that can go wrong. You know, the longer you're out there, the more that can go wrong. Yes. What is your um, race nutrition strategy like, and were you able to kind of maintain that throughout? And how did that how did that change over the course of the hundred miles, if it did? Yeah, so um, I started out, I I didn't have a super intense strategy as I guess has been the theme of what I've (laughs) talked about today. I I go a lot by feel, but I really started out eating um, cliff gels and um, I really primarily ate those for probably the first three fourths of the race. My stomach did start to get a little off close to about 80 miles um, and I got a little sick. But after that, I kind of transitioned more to avocados and Mm. I was primarily eating those. Those those felt good on my stomach. Um, So that's primarily what I ate during the race. And Mm. then I had S-Fuels that also supplemented some of that with liquid calories, which was beneficial. So I definitely used that throughout the day. it's their race plus. So yeah, that's primarily what I had um, during the race. Yeah, and did you, with the gels, was it, were you trying to do a gel every hour or was it really just, as things started to feel a bit like you were going a little bit low, you'd then have a gel to make you feel better? I would say that's probably pretty much, I, I try and, I probably was taking in about 200 calories an hour, I'd say on average. Mm. Um, and that was my sweet spot, but it's not precise. I, I kind of do go a lot by feel. Yeah, like yeah. since I don't have a watch on, I don't really like, Yeah, I'm not monitoring it as much, but I think that's probably about what I was eating. Yeah. And how did the race play out for you, Nicole? So obviously with the stomach issues that may have impacted on your pace a little bit, but as you kind of um, ticked off the laps, how were you feeling and, and were you getting a sense of kind of where you were at with regards to where you felt you should be, but also in relation to other people? So how did that play out? I really wasn't super focused on where other people were most of the race. I kind of was like, I I just felt really strong and consistent and going at my pace. Um, I think towards the fourth lap, I started to get confident because I felt like I was having a good day and that gave me a boost in confidence. So from there, I just kind of tried to finish. And then I was really fortunate that Zach was pacing me. So I had that added um, um, that added bonus there too. But um, 
Yeah, I I think I was mostly really, I think I did a really good job this race just focusing on what I wanted to do and just staying strong. Mm. I really just wanted to have a good race and feel good throughout the day. And I felt like I accomplished that. Yeah. And were there any kind of periods where, like, cause were you, was your race time was, it was 15, I want to say 15, 50 something, but I, I, but I don't. 17 maybe. I don't, I think it was like something around there. Oh, so, yeah. um, yeah, no. So I was thrilled with that time. I think that was great given the course. Um, it was amazing. It was like, it was oh, such a fast you. time. And I, I don't know, like, I guess in the hundred mile, I think, gosh, surely at some point someone's going to feel, you're going to feel not tired, but like, like sleepy tired but I just don't know actually the way that you're describing the race it sounded like it things were just feeling better and better until of course kind of that last 20 miles with the stomach but then of course you you started feeling better just after a little kind of dip. yeah 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 it was just a great day so you're always lucky when you have those days when you feel super strong and just run run well um I feel like you don't get them very often. Yeah. You know, a lot of times you, I, yeah, I felt like that was just a great day all around for me. So I was thrilled. Yeah. And if you, Nicole, have you had races where where things haven't gone so well? And what are some of the, um, I suppose, the key things you've learned through those races where things haven't gone to plan? Yeah, it's always challenging, but I think just continuing to problem solve and mm. just keep moving. So a lot of times I think you go through phases in a race where there's doubt. And I think just kind of figuring out how to change around your mindset mm. and run strong. So that's when I, I find that if I'm able to do that, then I can oftentimes change it. But, you know, some days just don't go as planned. So I've had races where um, I've just not I felt off and um you just have to go with it and do your best and just know it's the day and just line up for the next one yeah um and sometimes that's really hard especially when you have a string of them right like mm. um I think Zach reminds me a lot that you know even if you don't have a good day it's just building up for the next event and just keeping a long-term mindset about things versus just having a short-term thought process that I didn't run well on this given day mm. because that's just the reality on races you're just going to have bad days mm. and then and, and there's no kind of there's no reason for it it's just you wake up and you're like I just don't think it's going to be my day today and yeah you don't don't want to think in that mindset but you actually it's just something that you just feel like you know what I just don't feel like it's going to be that day and the disappointment I always describe like like a, a bad race or you know a um if you get injured or anything like that it's it feels so raw and so disappointing in that kind of week kind of following that event I mean that does diminish um, somewhat over the week but the the great thing is typically is you know people who enjoy running or any kind of sports there will be another one you know even if you yeah. really like just kind of trained your way up to this one another there's not you know something is is coming up in the not too distant future well pre-covid that was the case anyway yes so what's next for you nicole you know, I'm not sure. I, I'm running Western States in June, assuming that one takes off. Um, but in the meantime, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I think it just depends on what's going on um, in the next couple of months in the United States. But probably something, there's a lot of races in Phoenix so or the Phoenix area. So probably stay close to home. Yeah. Well, that sounds fantastic. And lastly, you know, we all, obviously Zach has, you know, a, an influence in, with regards to your running and, and things like that, just for, by virtue mm -hmm. of the guidance that he gives you and just being in that kind of same household. Do you have any other, are you, are you a runner who is also really interested in the running history and do you have kind of running mentors and other runners that you've looked up to? Anything like that, Nicole, or? 
Yeah, no, I I love following a lot of the really super speedy ladies, not actually in the ultra marathoning world, but I love following the fast steeplechasers, um, milers, marathon runners. So I'm super inspired by Sarah Hall this weekend running a fast time, who's amazing. Um, And I remember her running in college. So um, I think we're about the same age. So just yeah, I just am in awe of um, some of those speedy women, and I love that they're getting the focus. So same with Shalane Flanagan. To me, they're just the ultimate heroes. So I love following their stories. So yes, definitely a fangirl yeah. of them. Um, I don't spend as much time following the ultra running. I, you know, I I definitely read about it, but I think I primarily love following um, the shorter stuff. Oh, no, I, I completely understand that. Um, I'm a big fan of following kind of ultra running, both the, the, the shorter and the kind of longer stuff, just because I'm in awe of, of the things that people like you achieve. Um, so I'm definitely a fangirl of yours, Nicole, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you oh. racing in 2021. And Western States, well, that'll be you. fantastic. That's such an honor. Yes, no, I'm I'm excited. I've done that race now a couple of times, so mm. just gonna keep at it. Um, figure I'm in, so might as well give it another shot. Might as well give it another nudge. Nicole, thank you so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it, and it makes your busy schedule and in the lead up to the holidays. So have a merry Christmas, and thank you. You too. Thank I, you. I hope you have a great trip and holiday. I know you're gonna have fun. Um, exploring. Yeah, it'll it'll be great and I hope that you get within the holiday period you get some time to you know, do a bit of exploring in and around your region and go on the trails that you love and just enjoy it. Thanks. No, definitely will. This is the best time of year. It just, it's nice to take a break and reset. Lovely. Okay, thanks Nicole. Talk soon. Thank you so much. So good catching up. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nicole. You can tell she is super passionate about the sport and what she gets from it. So it was so great to have that conversation to chat to her. And apologies for the bird sounds that you would have heard in that recording in the background. We did record it in the lead up to Christmas and I was in a campground at the time, actually. Now you can find Nicole over on Instagram if you just head on over there and you can catch up with what she's up to at NKBitter. And I'll include that and her Facebook link in the show notes for today's episode. And next week on the show, I chat to Professor Stuart Gray about omega-3 fatty acids and muscle function and aging. So it is one not to be missed for anyone who is interested in optimal health and longevity. Uh, both now and in our older age. So until then, if you enjoyed the show, please head over to your favorite podcast platform and hit subscribe and also review uh, this podcast because that's the best way that other people are able to find out about Wikipedia. Until then, you can catch me on Instagram at Mickey Willardin which is also my handle on Twitter, where I share all of my kind of latest readings and research findings. You can also find me on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition, and then head over to my website, mickeywillardin.com, to sign up for any of my meal plans, including fat loss plans, athlete plans, or my just my real food nutrition plans, which are 28-day plans with shopping lists that help you navigate this, um, I suppose, this confusing nutrition space. Uh, And you also get the opportunity to get me in your inbox every week where I share with you what's on my mind and the latest kind of research and and things that I've been reading and, and putting into practice with clients. Loads of people have asked how they can best support the show and that's the way that you do it. So until next time, guys, have a fab week and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.